Good afternoon. So just to remind you, I have some more exams for those who didn't pick up them last week. It will be your last chance to get them today. If you have questions about the addition, ask Ashley. If you have questions about why you got a question wrong, you have to see either me or Dr. Silverstein. All right, today we are going to put viruses together. We're reaching the end of our, the replication part of this course. We've gone through all the stages. We're going to make some virus particles today. And then the rest of the course, we're going to talk about disease. So today we're going to use a few select viruses to illustrate principles like we have done so far in this course. We're going to talk about the principles of virus assembly. And these are some steps that uh, comprise assembly and they're color coded according to whether uh, viruses have to, all viruses have to do them or just some of them. So all viruses do this complete set of reactions. They have to make the individual proteins, of course, and we've talked a lot about how we do that, reaching mRNA and then translating mRNA into protein. They have to make a protein shell or a capsid, as we have seen. We've looked at the structure of those. They have to package the nucleic acid genome. We have not talked much about that. We'll, we'll hit on that a bit today put the nucleic acid in the capsid. Now, some viruses have a, a lipid envelope, as you know, derived from the host cell. So this is blue because not all viruses do that. And then we have uh, these last two points, uh, release from a host cell and maturation. And you'll see today that um, this can be reversed, actually. Some viruses mature before they're released from the cell, and others mature after they're released. Now, the release from the host cell, I put an asterisk here because there is one virus that I know of that matures in the cell and then stays there. There's no extracellular phase. And this is actually a virus of yeast. It's called LA virus. And uh, it's a double-stranded RNA virus. It's not spread extracellularly. It's just spread as the cells divide. So it's partitioned among the progeny yeast cells. It's a very unusual lifestyle, I suppose. And I'm not aware of any other examples of it, but that's the virus right here. It's an icosahedral virus, and uh, it's not ever released from the cell. Now, looking at all the viruses we have considered so far in this course, there are a lot of different structures. But you can really group them into, into categories. You know, there are viruses with icosahedral symmetry, <clears throat> with or without an envelope. There are helical nucleocapsids. And for the animal viruses, they usually have an envelope. Sometimes an icosahedral virus uh, will have an envelope here. But that's pretty much all the different combinations. There are different shapes and sizes, of course. But you can really simplify them. And here, they're further classified according to their genome. But all these structures, you can look at them, and you should be able to look at them by the end of today and say how they're formed, uh, how they're formed, and then by that, how it enters the cell. If it has an envelope, you can make predictions about how it gets in the cell and even how it replicates. So that's one of the goals today, to be able to look at an envelope or an icosahedral part particle and understand how it's assembled. Now, when th this is one slide to give you an inkling of why structure is important for viruses. This is called the tail of tupocorna viruses, and we're comparing poliovirus and rhinovirus. Now, polio, these are both pocornaviruses. Polio, of course, causes poliomyelitis. Uh, the way you acquire polio, we will see later on, we're going to have, we're going to talk about this in some detail. You ingest the virions, and they pass through your stomach and intestine and, and replicate in your lower alimentary tract. So they have to be resistant to low pH and high pH and enzymes and bile salts and all sorts of things. Now, that capsid has an icosahedral structure. It's very similar to the structure of rhinovirus. But rhinoviruses, if you swallowed a rhinovirus, and in fact, when you have a common cold, you do swallow a lot of them because the mucus traps the viruses and then you swallow it all the time. It's one way of clearing viruses. And those rhinoviruses are inactivated once they get into your stomach, the low pH of the stomach. And of course, if it ever made it out of the stomach, the high pH of the uh, uh, proximal intestine would also do it in as well. So it has an acid-sensitive capsid, and polio is a resistant capsid. Nevertheless, these two capsids, if you looked at them, you would not be able to predict this biological difference. So obviously, there are minor differences in the capsid that confer this. All right, so it's one example. We have many, as we talk about pathogenesis, we'll see many other examples where 
the structure of the virus can determine the outcome of infection. Now I'll bring you back to something we talked about very early on, the metastability of virions. Throughout today you have to remember that as we're assembling these particles, they need to be metastable. You're not going to make any covalent bonds among the subunits, remember that because these viruses have to be able to come apart when they get in a cell. They have to release the genome. Uh, so they have to be metastable, stable in the environment, like the polio viruses are stable in your gut tract. Even the rhinos are stable enough to be able to transmit from person to person, but they have to come apart doing infection. So assembly, the, this is the interesting point. The assembly process is reversible when the virus comes into the cell. But in the cell that makes the virus particle, which is what we're talking about today, the assembly particle is not reversible. As you will see, it goes in one direction, it drives assembly, and it's irreversible. So it's very different when you're coming in the cell. And of course, that's because the virus particles are encountering receptors or low pH or some other environment which takes advantage of their metastability. <clears throat> now, as always, with every other aspect of virus replication, the, the virus assembly process depends on host cell machinery at every step. So for example, there are chaperones in the cell uh, that assist in the folding of viral proteins, whether it be a capsid protein or a membrane glycoprotein, cellular chaperones. These assemblies, as you will see, have to move around from the nucleus to the plasma membrane or anywhere in between. And they don't do so by diffusion, as we talked about earlier. They use cellular transport mechanisms, mainly microtubules with the motors that are attached to these microtubules to move around. Viral membrane proteins, the glycoproteins that are in the lipid bilayer, these are produced and, and transported through the secretory pathways, beginning with the endoplasmic reticulum, moving through the Golgi to the plasma membrane. That whole pathway is a cellular pathway, of course. Virus doesn't encode any of it, so it takes exquisite use of it. And finally, as you will see, many uh, assembly steps take place in the nucleus. Of course, many genomes are replicated in the nucleus, uh, mostly DNA, but a few RNA genomes as well. And so they have to move in and out of the nucleus, and sometimes assembly happens in the nucleus as well. So some viruses will assemble there. So that takes advantage of the nuclear import uh, and export machinery to get things in and out of the nucleus. Now, a cardinal rule about assembly is that viral components have to be concentrated in the cell because nothing ha happens fast in a dilute solution. And there are a number of ways that viruses achieve this, which we'll talk about. But you can often see the result of this concentration and that you get these so-called factories or inclusions uh, in an infected cell. So many viruses replicate and produce components at very specific places, not all over the cytoplasm. They're in very specific places. And in fact, there is one here I would like to show you. Uh, this is a cell infected with rabies virus. And rabies virus infected cells have very typical inclusions. Here is the cell. And you can see these uh, darker staining roundish areas in the cytoplasm. Those are inclusions where the assembly precursors of rabies virions are being concentrated. In fact, this is a kind of cytopathic effect. And this is typical for rabies. They're called Guarnieri bodies. And in the old days when there was a lot of rabies, you could diagnose a case of rabies by looking uh, at, at infected cells from an individual. But what they are are concentrations of assembly precursors and they're in specific places to drive reactions because if it's dilute, uh, if the protein components and RNA components are dilute, the reaction doesn't proceed efficiently. This also happens uh, with non-envelope viruses uh, like poliovirus, as you will see, uses its, it uses internal membranes of the cell to concentrate proteins to replicate its genome on as well. So all kinds of, of viruses do that. Now, how do you get high concentrations? Um, so one of them is to get a factory, as I've just told you. You, you focus all, all the assembly precursors in a factory or some kind of localized site. That's a very common way to do it. And that allows you to take advantage of um, what we call sub-assemblies. As you'll see in a few moments, many viruses are built in a series of steps. You make, you make the door 
you know, you put the handle on, and you put the panels on the glass, and then you attach the door to the body. Uh, you do that all in concentrated areas of, of assembly. So this can happen in the cytoplasm. It can happen in the nucleus of the cell, depending on where assembly is taking place. But it can also happen on the membrane. So you can have patches of membrane where there are high concentrations of, say, viral glycoproteins and other structural components beneath, and that will be the site of virus formation. So think about it when you assemble a, a, an envelope virion, you don't want to scatter the glycoproteins all over the cell. It's a waste of material. You want them focused in one place where you can efficiently make virions. So you often do that, and you get these lateral interactions uh, between membrane-associated proteins. We'll see a photograph of that towards the end. Now, again, just a brief word again on movement of components in the cell. Uh, as you'll see, things happen in different places. The virus, of course, infects at the plasma membrane, but m most of them have to move inwards. Some of them have to get in the nucleus and then back out again. And so the, viruses, the virus replication schemes, schemes utilize transport systems of various sorts. And again, the reason is that the cytoplasm is crowded and things can't just diffuse throughout it. So these long distance movements from the plasma membrane to the nucleus and in between uh, require energy dependent motors that reside or move along microtubules. Uh, all viral proteins, when they have to be localized to specific places, uh, do so via addresses that are built into the protein. These are very simple sequences that specify location. For example, uh, membrane proteins, membrane glycoproteins, or other kinds of proteins that are going to be membrane associated. And they're not all membrane glycoproteins. They have signal sequences which direct them to the secretory pathway. Many of them have fatty acid modifications. As you will see, fatty acids are covalently linked to the viral proteins, and that allows the proteins to target membranes. Now, once a viral protein is put to a specific membrane, chances are it's desirable for it to remain there. So, for example, um, you put a a glycoprotein in the endoplasmic reticulum, but you don't want it to go through the Golgi to the plasma membrane. You want it to stay in the ER. So you have to put what we call retention signals. And you can put various signals to, reten to retain the proteins in different compartments. As you probably know, nuclear proteins, in order to get in the nucleus, require nuclear localization signals to get through the import pathway. RNAs or nucleic acids also have to get in. There aren't NLSs in nucleic acids, but proteins can interact with such nucleic acids that in themselves have nuclear localization signals. There are also export signals to get out of the nucleus. Uh, mRNAs, for example, need to get out. They have export sequences to get into the cytoplasm. And again, this is a point we've mentioned a couple times today. These components capsids or subassemblies uh, have directed motion. They move on microtubules and they're transported by these motor pathways. Here's an example of localization of viral proteins to the nucleus uh, for various purposes. Uh, and here's a typical cell, of course, uh, with various features. Nucleus here. And you see the cytoplasm is devoid of most things, which is not correct. It should be packed full of material, but that's for illustration. Here is, for example, uh, influenza virus nucleoprotein. It's being translated in the cytoplasm, of course, on ribosomes. And the nucleoprotein will eventually bind to influenza virus RNAs, and which are synthesized in the nucleus. So this protein has to get into the nucleus. It has an NLS. It is recognized by the nuclear import machinery and makes its way there because of that signal. Uh, two more examples. Adenoviruses are large DNA-containing viruses. They replicate their genomes in the nucleus. And new virions are assembled in the nucleus as well. So all the structural proteins for adenoviruses have to be imported into the nucleus. They, again, they have NLSs. And here, we're looking at two structural components, the hexon, which you may remember is one of the major components of the capsid, and then a, the 100 kilodalton protein. They're shipped in, and they participate in assembly. We'll look at that assembly pathway later. And here is a, a few structural proteins from a polyomavirus, the smaller DNA-containing viruses. They have icosahedral shells as well, but le less complex than those of adenoviruses. Here we show uh, VP5 and, and VP2 and 3. 
They are translated, of course, in the cytoplasm, and then they're shipped in the nucleus as a, in a form of a subassembly, which is shown here, uh, five copies of uh, VP1 and one copy each of VP2 and 3. Again, these have nuclear localization signals to bring them in the nucleus because the viral DNA is replicating there, and that's where new virions are going to be made. So a couple of examples of the localization of nuclear of viral proteins to the nucleus where assembly is going to begin. In a similar way, um, signals, in the first case, or the previous case, nuclear localization signals. In this case, signal sequences uh, localize vir viral glycoproteins to plasma membranes. And so, for example, if uh, your virus is going to be enveloped and it will acquire the envelope at the cell surface, as you'll see a bit later, uh, one of the first things that's done before formation of the particle is that viral glycoproteins are inserted into the plasma membrane. And again, they're put in very specific places, not all over the cell, but in patches. These are typical glycoproteins. They are made in the secretory pathway. They are initially made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes bind uh, the wall of the ER, uh, and the mRNAs encoding the viral glycoproteins are translated and the protein is inserted into the ER lumen. You can see that happening here. So these are anchored in the membrane of the ER. They are transmembrane proteins. Then they are shipped up to the plasma membrane by the secretory pathway, which I'm sure you know. It involves transport via vesicles uh, to, through the Golgi stack, and eventually uh, up to the plasma membrane. So these viral glycoproteins are captured in vesicles. The vesicles fuse their way to the surface, and eventually move to the plasma membrane. And all that motion, all that movement of vesicles is microtubule dependent. And as you'll see later, sometimes these proteins have a destiny uh, shorter than the plasma membrane. Some of them want to stay in the ER or in the Golgi. In that case, they would have a retention signal to keep them uh, in the right compartment. Now here's an example of the movement of a virion subassembly on microtubules. This is vesicular stomatitis, virus nucleocapsids. This is um, an RNA virus with a helical nucleocapsid. And this virus replicates its genome in the cytoplasm. It makes progeny RNA, which are then bound by the nucleocapsid protein to make a helical RNP. So that's made in the cytoplasm. And then it has to migrate to the plasma membrane, where it's going to then acquire a lipid envelope. So it has to move, and it does so on microtubules. And this is an experiment which shows you the microtubule dependence of that movement. So in this experiment, uh, the viral nucleoprotein is labeled with GFP, green fluorescent protein, so you can see it here. And the microtubule network in the cell is stained red. So here's a wild-type cell infected with VSV. You can see these, each dot is actually an individual uh, nucleocapsid. That's going to make its way into a virion and they're moving from the cytoplasm to the periphery on microtubules. Now, if you treat these cells with nicotazole, it is a drug that uh, disperses the microtubule network in the cell. This is what happens. Now, you can see there are no more nice microtubule filaments, no, no more tracks on which to move, and the VSV nucleocapsids are stalled at very specific places in the cytoplasm. They can't move to the periphery. So it shows that movement of this VSV nuclear capsid requires microtubules. And this is true for many, many uh, other viruses. All right, so those are just some general principles about how um, we move components around in cells. Now let's talk about specific assembly pathways. And we have, um, in general, many viruses make, as I said before, subassemblies where you make individual components and then you assemble them. It all depends on the complexity of the virus particle, as you'll see. And here we have three strategies for making those sub-assemblies. It's, again, a precursor to a virus particle. Uh, the first one is we make the sub-assembly from individual protein molecules. So we translate these, of course, in the cytoplasm, and uh, the, then they assemble to form the subunit. So this is the case of simian virus 40. Which, is an which has an icosahedral shell made up of VP1, 2, and 3. We saw in a previous slide an image of similar proteins from a polyomavirus getting into the nucleus via nuclear localization signals. So here we're translating VP1, and it folds into the correct shape, and so does VP2 and 3. And then these assemble into what's called a pentamer. 
that's a subassembly. It's made up of five copies of VP1 uh, and one copy each of VP2 and VP3. And so they're made from different proteins. Two different proteins are individually translated and assembled into this subassembly. It's not the virus yet, right? It's going to be eventually when you're going to put a bunch of these pentamers together, 12 of them, and we're going to make a virus particle. So this is a subassembly. Here's another example, adenovirus type 2. And here we're going to make a penton. And a penton is the structure you find at each five-fold axis of symmetry of that virus. These are, again, icosahedral viruses. They're more complicated. They're not just simple capsids. They have these fibers sticking out from each five-fold axis. And if you remember from our entry talk, those are needed to attach to the host cell. The virus attaches to receptors via this knob at the tip. So this is made from individual proteins. The protein 4 is translated to make the fiber. It's actually a trimer, three copies of protein 4. So it has a very extended helical portion and a globular domain at the top. These assemble into a trimer called the fiber. And then we make individual protein 3 components. And you can see five of those assembled to make a base. So that's one subassembly. And then we have a second subassembly, which is called the penton. And again, when the virion is made, this, of course, is, is not the virion yet. When the virion is made, this will be one of the subassemblies that go to make the intact virion. All right, so this is assembly from individual protein molecules. It's one strategy to make a subassembly. Here are two more. Uh, another way that's utilized by many viruses is to make a polyprotein precursor. You remember that many viruses encode polyproteins in their genomes, and this is a strategy for getting a, a number of proteins made from one mRNA. Because remember, in eukaryotic cells, you have the one message, uh, one protein rule for the most part. And vi one way viruses get around that is to make a polyprotein and cleave it. So here is the polyprotein of poliovirus. It's being translated on ribosomes. So that's the viral RNA there. The protein is made um, by translation. And it is actually cleaved from the growing polyprotein very soon after its synthesis is done, VP1, 2, 3, and 4. As soon as all four of those are made, um, it is cleaved from the polyprotein. And then this precursor can fold. It has all the information to properly fold by itself. If you, could, if you could make this in a cell separate from all the other replication that's going on, it would fold properly and make a, eventually a structural unit. So this, this P1 precursor folds. And then uh, these bonds are cleaved by one of the two viral proteases, 3C. And you now have the what's called the 5S structural unit. So now each is an individual polypeptide, and these bonds have all been cleaved. So that's an example of assembly from a polyprotein precursor. Many viruses do that. So instead of individually making VP1, 2, 3, and 4, as we saw with, with SV40, you make it as a precursor. It folds and is processed. And the, the third way of getting these subassemblies is what's called chaperone-assisted assembly. So uh, here, is, as an example, is the trimer of adenovirus, the hexon trimer. This is, the hexon is one of the main building blocks of the capsid. You make, make capsid out of these components. They are translated as protein 2. This, so this is a viral mRNA being translated to make protein 2. And protein 2 trimerizes with the assistance of two other proteins, a viral uh, 100 kilodalton protein called L4. And this acts as a chaperone, as well as, a, so that's a viral chaperone. I'm sorry, I said two proteins, but it's just one. Uh, this is, in itself, the 100 kD protein is a viral chaperone that makes sure that these three hexon subunits are folding correctly and they're not aggregating or uh, doing anything incorrect. If something incorrect happens, the chaperone will direct the protein to degradative pathways and won't be used to build new viruses. So that's chaperone-assisted assemblies. Many viruses use their own chaperones. But others use cellular proteins. We have a lot of chaperones in our cells, almost as many as ribosomes. And um, they're very important for correct folding of proteins, and viruses take advantage of those as well. So you have to have quality control in the assembly process. If you make crummy proteins and put them into a virion, you're going to have a crummy virion. So you have to make sure at every step of the way you're making good, properly folded proteins. Now, another uh, general idea that we're going to talk about in assembly is uh, 
sequential versus what we call concerted. And so, and sometimes there's a mixture of both, as you will see, but the concepts are useful to consider. In sequential assembly, we make components and we put them together one step at a time, very much like an automobile assembly line. And this is exemplified here for poliovirus. Uh, you remember, this is a virus with icosahedral symmetry, no envelope, and these viruses bind receptors. Uh, the genome ends up in the cytoplasm and it's translated into a polyprotein, as we've just decided. And remember, we just talked about the, how the P1 folds and is eventually cleaved to give what's called a 5S structural unit. This is the first structural precursor. Uh, then five of those are going to associate to form pentamers. All right? Five, five S structural units are going to associate. They spontaneously do that. They have all the information to associate with each other, and they form these pentamer-like structures shown here. These can infect in an infected cell form an empty shell without RNA. And for many years, we didn't know why these were being formed. These seem to be sort of storage areas for uh, excess pentamers because this is a reversible reaction. It was thought for a while that the RNA might be put into a 75S empty capsid, but there's no way to do that. There's no opening, so it must be reversible. What happens is we think the 14S pentamers bind the genomic RNA, which is made, of course, by replication. It binds the genomic RNA, and then the pentamers associate to form the intact icosahedral virion. Okay, so 12 pentamers come together, uh, and again, they do that spontaneously. The interactions among the proteins are such that they will spontaneously form pentamers at, a right, at the right concentration, I should say. And all this happens in very specific areas to allow for high local concentrations of capsid components. And so then this virion uh, undergoes one more cleavage step. Uh, the bond between VP4 and VP2 is cleaved, and now we have infectious virus particles which are released. And we don't know what actually carries out that last cleavage step. It happens only when the RNA is in the capsid. So this illustrates stepwise assembly. You make a precursor 5S, then you make 14S, and then you make the complete capsid. These S numbers, by the way, are old. They come from old virology history. In the old days, people used to measure uh, components, especially big components like these, by their sedimentation in sucrose gradients. You'd make a gradient of sucrose in a tube, and you spin it in the centrifuge, and you see where your component went to. And these names still stick, even though, as far as I know, it's not used anywhere near as frequently as it used to be. So the, we're staying with this uh, assembly line idea, and this illustrates it really well for the assembly of a tailed bacteriophage. Um, and not only is this an interesting concept, but it has a purpose. The assembly line idea makes sure that you make all the components properly so that in the end, uh, what you get out, the virion that you get out, is properly assembled. So there are quality control steps along the way, not only folding by chaperones, but a lot of the sequential assembly steps will not happen if the components aren't made properly. So you know, if the door isn't square, it's not going to fit into the opening in the car. And so if the viral components aren't made properly, they won't fit. So here, this phage in the end, of course, has a head, which is an icosahedral head. It's got a tail and tail fibers. And these are all made independently. And each of these numbers indicates the gene number which makes a protein that goes into the assembly of this, of this uh, component. So here, for example, we're doing uh, the tail assembly. You have a whole, a whole number of genes that are involved in just making that little plate at the bottom of the tail that anchors the phage onto the host cell when it goes to infect. And there are a series of steps that are sequential. You can't get to this one without completing all the previous ones. The tail then associates with this long central protein, and then finally a number of disks stack up along that, that central protein to, find, to form the tail. And again, if the disk isn't formed right, it's not going to fit onto the tail. And if this central uh, shaft here is, not, is denatured, say, it's not properly chaperoned, it's not going to fit in. So every step makes a proper product, and, and the whole assembly process flows. Same thing with the head. You make an icosahedral head going through the number of steps of adding proteins and maturing. And again, if this head isn't made properly, it's not attached to a tail. And finally, the tail fibers are also made of a number of proteins going through various morphogenic steps. 
and they're attached at the end. And the key here is not only the assembly line concept, but you cannot proceed through this reaction unless all the components are properly formed. So that gives you good quality control. So the more steps you have, the more quality control will be effective. So let's talk about a couple of specific examples uh, of assembly uh, of larger viruses now. And here is uh, a herpes virus, uh, which is, a, as you remember, a DNA-containing virus. It replicates its genome in the nucleus, and that is where new virus particles are going to be assembled in the nucleus of the cell. So you have a lot of genomes there, and later in infection, when you have a good number of genomes, uh, you then begin to make structural proteins in the cytoplasm. The mRNAs are made, they're shipped out, they're translated into structural proteins, and then the proteins come back in. Of course, they're imported by NLS sequences on each protein. And so here we have shown in the nucleus, so here's the nucleus here, and these are nuclear pores. These are various herpes viral proteins that are be going, going to be used to build uh, these capsids. So we have um, VP5 pentamers and hexamers. Remember, this is a big capsid, so it has both pentamers and hexamers, not just pentamers. It's a consequence of making a larger capsid. It has uh, some smaller protein called triplexes, which are going to line the capsid shell. Uh, it has a portal protein. Remember, every virion has one portal, and this will serve to get DNA in. And also, when this infects another cell, the portal helps the DNA to come out. And that's going to be located just at one of the five-fold axis of symmetry. And then we have other proteins, which have a very interesting role. They have two roles, actually. They serve as a scaffold and as a protease to get rid of the scaffold. So this, pro this capsid is so big that you can't depend on it self-assembling correctly. It needs a scaffold. So the first thing that happens is you have assembly of what's called a procapsid of VP5 and pentamers and hexamers, uh, but it's not a mature capsid. And it can only exist because it's built upon this protein scaffold, which is in the interior. So this is different from most scaffolds that you see outside. When there's a scaffold on a building, it's typically on the outside, and you build the building inside. Here we're putting the scaffold on the interior of the particle, and then the capsid is built around it. Okay, again, the scaffold is needed to help prop the proteins into place until they lock into position. Now, when, when it's ready to lock into position, uh, this scaffold actually in, in, includes in it a protease. Uh, so the scaffold protein precursor has a protease in it. It's called VP24. And at some critical step, the protease is activated, and it auto-digests itself. It gets rid of the scaffold, so it digests it to small fragments. And now, the, the, at the same time, the capsid matures. So you can see it's gone from a procapsid to a, a, an icosahedral-looking state. And now it's a mature capsid, except for the presence of genomic DNA. And then it's put in by the portal opening. And we'll talk about how that specifically gets in a bit later. So this is a series of sequential assembly steps. Uh, and it's interesting that it uses a, a scaffold. And of course, the scaffold is removed by a viral protease. So it's a very clever way to get rid of it. If you don't get rid of the scaffold, of course, there's no room for the nucleic acid genome. So that was sequential assembly uh, of a herpes virus. Uh, here's another example. Uh, it's labeled sequential assembly, but as you'll see, it actually has components of both. So this is adenovirus, which also is a relatively large uh, DNA-containing virus. Uh, it replicates its genome in the nucleus. And it also assembles particles in the nucleus as well. So again, we're looking at the nucleus of a cell. Here's the nuclear membrane and our nuclear pore complexes. And again, this is, this is a bigger virus, so it's made up of quite a few different proteins. Uh, and these proteins are all translated, of course, in the cytoplasm by viral messages that are made in the nucleus and shipped out. And then the proteins have to go back in the nucleus by their NLSs. Now, remember, a major component of the capsid is this hexon trimer. So that is assembled in the cytoplasm. Remember, we talked about how that is made by chaperone-dependent assembly. And the chaperone happens to be a viral protein here. So that gets uh, assembled and put into the nucleus. 
Uh, and then we also need a whole lot of other virion proteins that we haven't talked about, but which contribute to the intact capsid. And then, of course, our pentons, which we also talked about in terms of assembly from different polypeptide chains. These are made in the cytoplasm, assembled, and then get shipped into the nucleus. So again, the individual components. Now, what we have first is we have the production of an empty capsid which doesn't have DNA in it and has a variety of proteins. Additional viral proteins are added. You can see they're here. The, their identity is not important to you. It's just that the main point is that it is a series of steps going from an empty capsid to an assembly intermediate. And then this is believed to be the substrate for insertion of the DNA genome. And then what you finally get is what's called a young virion, which is not yet finished. And then finally, it has to be matured by a viral protease called L3, and that gives us the mature virion. So again, you see a series of steps from making individual components, empty capsid, assembly intermediate, young virion, and virion. So that in itself is sequential assembly. This, this whole scheme is a bit unsettled or controversial. People are not quite sure if this is, in fact, the way it actually works. And there's another... Uh, theory for how this assembly occurs on this slide, and that is that there is what's called concerted assembly. That is, all the components come together at once to make a young virion. So that's the difference. Sequential, you add them one at a time. Concerted, they, all the components are made, and then they assemble, they coalesce together with the viral DNA into a particle. And then it undergoes one more mat maturation step. So I'm telling you both of these because both models are in the literature and it's not clear if one or the other is right, but they actually illustrate the two different kinds of assembly. Sequential step by step and putting everything together in one step, that's concerted to make the virus particle. We'll see these coming up in a few other viruses as well. Now, uh, back to... Um, the idea of self-assembly versus assisted assembly. So we have talked a little bit so far in this course of the idea that if you express capsid proteins, they will assemble into virus particles. And by that, we, we mean self-assembly. Um, I think we talked before about, or maybe not, how HBV surface antigen can assemble into virus-like particles. You just express one viral protein, it makes particles. We did mention the HPV vaccine, Gardasil. Uh, that consists of a viral protein which you express in yeast or in insect cells and it self-assembles into particles. These are called virus-like particles or VLPs because they don't have genomes in them. But the, the principle of making them is based on this idea that a lot of viral proteins will self-assemble without any help. Okay? Other examples include HIV capsid proteins. You can express just that gag precursor, which has capsid and nucleocapsid and a few other proteins, they will make particles in a cell. And uh, the HA glycoprotein of influenza virus, it's one of the two membrane glycoproteins, if you just express that in cells, you get particles made. They're empty, but they have a membrane, and they have the glycoprotein in it. And in fact, this is a, the basis for an experimental flu vaccine that is currently in clinical trials. They take the gene encoding the HA, that's just one glycoprotein of influenza virus, and they express it in tobacco plants. And the, the HA forms particles, which you can then easily purify from the fluids of the plant leaves. You just crush the leaves and centrifuge out the particles. And apparently, these are very immunogenic particles. Uh, from a square meter of tobacco plants, you can make something like 20,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, at, a, at a very low price, and it can be done very quickly. So this is an advantage over the current flu vaccines, which take months and months to prepare, as we'll see uh, later on. But that's, again, based on this idea that certain viral proteins can self-assemble without any, any other help. Then we have a, a assisted assembly, which we have talked about a bit, where you need chaperones to assemble particles, or you need scaffolds in the case of adenovirus. So if you expressed uh, the adenovirus structural proteins without the scaffold protein, you would get a really bad capsid that wouldn't be able to last very long. It would be very unstable because it needs the, shap uh, excuse me, the, sh the scaffold inside in order to make the proper structure. So two kinds of, of assembly, self-assembly and assisted assembly. All right, let's talk about another, the, the concerted assembly, which we mentioned briefly in, in terms of adenovirus, 
in, in, uh, in the scheme of assembly of influenza virus. So this is going to get you into how an enveloped virus is made now, which we haven't really talked about that much. So this is the replication uh, scheme of influenza. If you remember, these viruses uh, bind cellular receptors. Uh, it's not shown here. The genome of the virus, which is a negative strand RNA bound to a number of proteins. It's a ribonucleoprotein. Uh, it has to be copied into mRNAs. So the genome is shown here. It gets into the nucleus. It's a, one of the few RNA viruses that replicates its genome in the nucleus. Uh, so from the genome, you make messenger RNAs. Again, in the nucleus, they're shipped out into the cytoplasm. And they, they give rise to various proteins. Uh, they give rise to some soluble or cytoplasmic proteins shown here, uh, which, in fact, have to be um, associated with newly made viral RNAs. So they have to get shipped back into the nucleus. Uh, other viral mRNAs encode the two, the two or three uh, structural proteins of the virion, the two glycoproteins in the ion channel, HA, NA, and M2. And those get transported to the plasma membrane by the secretory pathway, as shown here. Uh, so they get focused in very specific places uh, on the plasma membrane. Now, meanwhile, we're making uh, the ribonucleoprotein or the nucleocapsid, that is the RNA bound to proteins. Because remember, in the virion of flu, we have eight segments of RNA, each associated with four different proteins. So the RNAs are replicated through a, negative, a positive strand intermediate. We go negative plus minus. And then these negative strands are going to be assembled into the newly made virion. Now, in the nucleus, so these, these RNAs have to get out, but they don't have any way of getting out on their own. So they actually bind uh, two proteins. The blue one uh, is the M1 protein. And the other one is called NEP, or nuclear export protein. And that does exactly what the name says. It lets the RNA get out of the nucleus. Because without that NEP, it, the, the RNA would stay in the nucleus and nothing would ever happen. So the NEP allows the uh, RNP now to get into the cytoplasm. So now you can see why M1 and NEP were shipped into the nucleus, because they're essential for this step. This uh, RNP now has to associate with uh, the part of the plasma membrane that has the viral glycoproteins. And there's some very specific interactions that guide this, and we'll talk about some of them. And this is part of the reason why you want the glycoproteins expressed just in patches. You don't want them all over because you want focused, uh, concentrated reactions that go forward rapidly. Now, the M, the blue protein is the M protein. Uh, this binds the RNP to the membrane. And then this whole assembly pinches out in what's called a budding reaction. And you have a new virion formed. And a new, new virion, of course, is studded with glycoproteins, or spikes, as we've called them. And underneath it is the blue protein, the M protein. We're only showing two RNAs here, so it's not a complete virion. The entire membrane, the inner side of this membrane, would be covered with M1 proteins. And then we would have eight RNA segments in there. So this actually is concerted assembly because the whole particle comes together at once at the end. But you have some sequential steps of assembly, for example, of the RNA plus proteins to do that. So again, the idea is that you make the virion at one step uh, during this budding process. So this is something that happens for many of the viruses we've talked about so far, this budding. Uh, and it can happen not just at the plasma membrane, but also at different membranes in the cell. All right, let's take a, a close, brief look at this HA molecule and talk about how it is made and put into this assembly process. Again, the HA is hemagglutinin. We're going to talk about this a lot in, in biological aspects later on in the course. Uh, and that is a glycoprotein. There are, there's another one, of course, the neuraminidase um, in the membrane as well. But this is the HA. It is a trimer in the viral membrane. That's the structure. Uh, and remember, this attaches the cell receptor. At the top is the sialic acid binding site. It also has a fusion peptide buried near the membrane. And it's hidden until the pH drops and it's exposed so that the virus can fuse with the endosome. So here's a schematic of the HA protein. It's one HA monomer shown here. Here is either the cell or the viral membrane. It's a transmembrane glycoprotein. It has a little piece of sequence in the cytosol or in the virion interior. 
You can see it's decorated with sugars. These little Ys are sugar links uh, to the proteins, and uh, a glycoprotein, of course. Um, there are a lot of disulfide bonds here, the SSs with the yellow lines. And those, of course, contribute to the structure of the protein. And here is the fusion peptide. Now, you remember that in order to get fusion, this peptide has to be exposed. It's exposed by a cleavage reaction, which occurs right here. This cleavage makes a free end terminus so that when the pH drops in the endosome, this fusion peptide can be exposed and inserted into the endosome membrane. That cleavage, again, is carried out by cell proteases. Now, here you can see why the cleavage works in a way that these two fragments remain attached because they have this disulfide bond joining them. So even if you cleave the protein here, it remains attached to the virion by this disulfide bond. And of course, at the end terminus is the signal sequence, which gets it in the secretory pathway to begin with. That is removed, of course, once the protein is in the ER lumen by signalases. So this is a schematic of the production of viral HA and its transport from the ER uh, to the plasma membrane. So again, it's translated on, on ribosomes, which abut the, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We call those rough ER. Uh, the protein is inserted uh, into the lumen, uh, and then the end terminus actually uh, sticks into the membrane, and eventually that's cleaved by signalase. And here's the mature protein after its translation. You can see that the cytoplasmic domain is, is right here. Uh, this is the transmembrane domain. So that's what it looks like when it's initially made, the transmembrane. Here's the, uh, what will be the HA part on the exterior of the virion. And this will be the interior of the virion. It's actually anchored to the membrane. This, this what we call the cytoplasmic tail, is anchored by a, a lipid. It's a covalently attached lipid which, which anchors it there. And we're not sure why that happens, but it's essential for infectivity. These glycoproteins then move through the secretory pathway, as I indicated before. They move in vesicles uh, through the Golgi network. And as they move through, they're oligomerized. Uh, they're glycosylated. The sugars are added. And of course, various sugars are added in different compartments. And those sugars are essential for proper folding, their proper quality control of the folding, and oligomerization of the glycoprotein. And in some cells, depending on the cell, the HA can be cleaved towards the end of the secretory pathway uh, where the pH is uh, neutral. Earlier on in the pathway, the pH is lower. So you don't want to cleave HA here because it would fuse immediately and that would be the end of assembly. So the cleavage, when it happens in the cell, the cap happens late. So now you have the end terminus of the HA is exposed, so the fusion peptide is exposed, ready for when the virus encounters a new cell. And eventually these make it to the plasma membrane where they're put into virions by budding, as we just described. Okay, so that's influenza. Again, mostly concerted assembly, but there are a few sequential steps that are involved. Now I want to contrast that with a retrovirus assembly, which does things in a generally similar way, but there's some interesting differences. Uh, this is also concerted assembly. So this is a cell infected with a retrovirus. Remember the DNA, the provirus, is inserted into the genome of the cell. That proviral DNA is being transcribed into messages. Messages uh, are used to make viral protein. And this is the precursor to the structural protein shown right here. The viral genome is also made from the full-length messages transcribed from proviral DNA. And those are shown here. And you may remember that um, as the RNA goes into the virion, it's going to be a dimer. So I'm showing the two plus-stranded RNAs as a dimer here. So what happens is these come out of the nucleus, and the RNA binds um, nucleocapsid protein. That's this protein right here, NC. This is an RNA-binding protein. And it takes with it capsid and matrix protein, you can see here also some other C-terminal proteins. So these come on actually uh, as a precursor, and they direct the viral RNA to the membrane at where the viral glycoprotein TMSU has already been inserted, gone through the same secretory pathway as flu HA. So there are very specific signals for getting this matrix protein here. As you'll see, there's some lipid addition signals. And there's also interaction between 
the glycoprotein and the, and the matrix protein. So, so far we have viral RNA with nucleocapsid, capsid and matrix. And you can see them lining up here on the plasma membrane, each of these. And some of them, of course, have RNA, but many of them, many of the protein subunits are protein alone because you only want two RNAs per virion, right? So once you have two in here, all the other subunits that get put in are simply uh, matrix, capsid, and C precursors without RNA. All right, so now we have a budding virion. It's got two RNAs. It's got uh, a whole lot of capsid and nucleocapsid and matrix proteins. But of course, remember, you always have to, you also have to bring in reverse transcriptase, integrase, and RNA-SH, and protease. You have to bring four other enzymes into the capsid. Their synthesis isn't shown here, but you may remember that they are made as a gag pol fusion. Sometimes you get suppression of termination or ribosomal frame shifting, and you get a fusion protein of GAG, which is what this is, with the rest of the genome encoding uh, the reverse transcriptase, uh, RNA-SH, and integrase. Okay. So those are shown here, the GAG pole fusion. And you get a number of those put in. And you can see they have matrix protein, which directs them to the site of budding, the same signals that direct this matrix that doesn't have RT and so forth will direct this matrix to the site of budding as well. So you incorporate a number of reverse transcriptases and integrases and so forth. You will also have protease, that's the yellow one, uh, as part of that uh, enzyme complex as well. So now we have a growing virion with two RNAs. We have about 100 molecules of RT per virion and the protease, and now it forms by budding. So this comes out in buds. But this actually is not the mature virion. The protease that has been packaged in the virion then carries out the final steps of maturation. It cleaves uh, a number of these protein precursors, and the final core is produced here. The final structure is produced upon proteolytic activity. So that's an example of some sequential assemblies of RNA with protein assemblies, and then a concerted assembly making the virion all at once as you butt out, and then maturation outside of the, the cell. So the maturation here occurs actually at the final steps extracellularly. So let's take a look at this uh, glycoprotein. Let me go back and show you what I'm going to show you. So this TMSU, this is the equivalent of the viral hemagglutinin infraflu. These are the glycoproteins that are put in the envelope so that the virions can attach uh, to cell receptors. They are uh, this, this is what they look like for two different retroviruses, uh, avian leukosis virus and HIV. It's a typical transmembrane uh, glycoproteins. You can see they're highly glycosylated. The Ys are sugar residues that are attached. There are fusion peptides. There are signal sequences which get these into the secretory pathway. And of course, these orange triangles are sites of cleavage which liberate an N-terminal fusion peptide. Again, you always have to have a free fusion peptide so that it can insert into the membrane. And again, here uh, you can see the, the final mature viral glycoprotein, uh, the TM with its fusion peptide. It's buried near the membrane so it doesn't randomly fuse. And then the SU protein here, it's shown covalently attached by a disulfide, but not all retroviruses do that. So it's very similar in principle to the HA. The details are just different. Now, as I said before, sometimes uh, viral proteins get modified with lipids, and there are a variety of different lipids that you can use. Meristate is a typical one, which is put typically near the end terminus of a protein, and meristate and these other lipids have the function of targeting the proteins to membranes. So we've talked about some other signals that will target proteins to membranes, like a signal sequence. But uh, in some cases, these proteins are not going through the signal pathway. So you have to have other mechanisms for targeting them to membranes. And this is one by putting lipids, small lipids like meristate, or uh, in this case, uh, palmitate or geranil, geranol. The actual names are not important. The point is they are covalently linked to the protein, and they provide lipid uh, targeting sequences. And so here is an example of how this works um, in the GAG precursor of retroviruses. So we just talked about this replication scheme uh, 
a few slides ago, the production of the gag structural protein and the association of it with viral RNA to produce a particle. So now what we are looking at is, is just uh, the end terminus of that gag protein, the matrix, which is shown here. And remember, the matrix has to target the membrane here at the plasma membrane, either with or without viral RNA. And the way it does so is in part by a meristate which is covalently linked to its end terminus. This is again a lipid, and that makes MA have affinity for membranes. Uh, there are also other signals as well, which you can see here. There are some positively charged regions of the protein which contribute to binding, but a major signal is this meristate. If you alter the protein so it's not meristylated, the M doesn't make it to membranes, and you disrupt particle formation. All right, the next step we have to consider, one of the last ones, is genome packaging. You have to get the viral genome uh, into the growing capsids. Remember, in a cell, the cell is full of RNA and DNA, but virions typically only contain viral DNA or viral RNA. So there's some aspect of specificity. Um, an example, in a cell infected with a retrovirus, the retroviral RNA is about 1% of the total RNA that's present. Yet, the virions have nothing but retroviral RNA in them. And the reason why is that because there are packaging signals in the genome. There are very specific sequences that say, I have to interact with a viral protein to get into the virion. So I want to tell you about just a few of these and how they work. These packaging signals are in both DNA and RNA virus genomes. Here are some examples in DNA genomes, uh, adenoviruses. Uh, in the uh, enhancer region is actually the location of the packaging sequences, these little blue arrows, um, the origin of replication over here. So there's an overlap between the enhancer and the packaging, and these are defined genetically. You make mutations and you ask what sequences disrupt the insertion of this DNA into the viral capsid. The SV40 uh, packaging signal also uh, overlaps with the origin and the enhancer, as you can see here. Again, a series of sequences which are essential for the insertion of this DNA into a shell. And it interacts with various protein components to do that. Here's an example of how the herpes genome is packaged. Uh, remember the herpes capsid has a portal at one five-fold axis that's shown right here, the portal. The DNA is going to go through there. When this genome replicates, it makes head-to-tail copies. In other words, concatamers repeated full-length units of the genome linked to one another, head-to-tail concatamers. And what happens is these concatamers are, are recognized by the portal and associated proteins because they have these so-called PAC sequences, which are at the five prime end of the genome, PAC1 and 2. These are recognized by the portal. And the portal is actually a machine. It starts to pull in the genome when it, once it recognizes the packaging signal. You can see it's being pulled in, pulled in. It keeps motoring it in. It requires energy. And then when two things, conditions are met, first, a head full is reached, that is the capsid can't hold any more DNA, and the second set of pack sequences is recognized by this portal machinery. At that point, there's a nuclease that cuts the genome at just the right place, and now you have an exact full-length herpes genome in the capsid. And then this can go on to be packaged into another capsid. So you have a portal machine that basically recognizes this packaging sequence and puts in a full unit length of genome. Uh, RNA viruses also have packaging signals. Uh, these are some packaging signals for retroviruses. Um, here on the left is the packaging signal of HIV. So here, uh, the, pack is the packaging signal for the HIV genome is at the left end, um, in the left LTR. This is just a part of the whole genome here, and it consists of this highly structured RNA. It's called a psi sequence. You'll see this red psi indicating packaging sequences. Uh, and what happens, this is a, a series of stem loop structures, which uh, when you have two RNAs together, remember the RNA is packaged as a dimer, uh, these uh, red areas form what's called a kissing loop complex. They hybridize, so two sequences from two different RNAs uh, form this complex, which is base paired, and that is the substrate for packaging. And we'll see how that works in a minute. Uh, these are HIV and related viruses are called complex retroviruses because they have a lot of viral proteins. And they're also simple retroviruses, including Maloney uh, 
uh, murine leukemia virus, avian leukosis virus. We'll talk about this one a bit later. Uh, this is the mRNA of these two viruses. They have packaging sequences as well as you can see here. And for the Maloney one, uh, this is necessary and sufficient for packaging. It allows the full length uh, genome to be packaged into the particle. If you remember, there is a splice site here that removes uh, the gag and pole region so that the envelope can be translated from a smaller message. That does not have the packaging sequence, and that explains why it's not packaged. Uh, the ALV type viruses, the, the packaging sequence is necessary but not sufficient for packaging. It requires sequences in gag and pole as well, because you can see here that this packaging sequence is present in both full length RNA and in the spliced envelope RNA, uh, yet even though the spliced envelope RNA has that size sequence, it's not packaged. So it's necessary but not sufficient. So this is how the HIV packaging signal works. Here is the packaging sequence in, in one RNA. And when this interacts with a second RNA, remember there are always two RNAs in the virion, you get inter-RNA base pairing as shown here. And it exposes what were previously base paired sequences. So you can see here in this segment, in this segment, these sequences are base paired. But when two RNAs come together, they are exposed, and these turn out to be the binding sites for the nucleocapsid protein. And that is the protein that coats the RNA along with matrix and gets it into the particle. So here you can see a single RNA, two RNAs form this structure exposing the NC binding site the nucleocapsid can then go on and bind to this. If you think back to that sequence slide that I showed earlier, uh, NC and matrix and capsid are all brought into the budding virion along with the RNA, and that's how it happens. The NC is binding this specific structure uh, on the RNA. Um, for, for viruses with icosahedral capsids, there's typically a packaging limit. It's usually 5 or 10% larger than the genome, so a poliovirus can't take much more in it than 5 or 10% because the capsid constrains it. Uh, envelope viruses typically don't have such constraints, and you can put genes in them if you want to, say, use them for gene therapy. Um, and some, some viruses don't have packaging signals that we can find, and we don't know what confers specificity for genome packaging. And an example is polio. There's no packaging single. We don't know how the genome is specifically put into capsids. One idea is that all the vesicles that are made during uh, replication somehow contributes to that. Now, an interesting conundrum arises when we talk about segmented genomes of viruses. And the question is, how do you make sure that every particle has the right number of segments? Like flu has eight. Uh, different RNA segments, and how do you make sure every new particle has the right eight? So there are two ideas. One is that you randomly grab eight segments from the pool in infected cells. And if you did that, if you do the numbers, you, you end up with one infectious particle per 400 assembled. So just a random packaging of eight. And that's sort of what the infectivity of influenza is, one in about 400 particles. If you allow packaging of more segments, like 12, the number goes up to 10%, which is even better. And some people have found that some flu particles have extra segments, not just eight. But it turns out that there may be a specific sequence on each of the eight RNA segments, which direct them all to the right binding sites in the capsid. We think we know what the sequences are and how they interact with the, with the capsid protein is being worked out. So the idea is that each of the flu RNA segments has a sequence at its end, which allows it to be specifically incorporated uh, into a virion. And in support of that is this electron micrograph of flu viruses. And you can see there's always a very regular uh, arrangement of these segments, which suggests a very specific mechanism of incorporation. If they were just put in randomly, you might not expect to see that. Now, there, there are some examples of what we call selective packaging, which is very interesting. This is one. It's a, a bacteriophage of Pseudomonas. It contains three double-stranded RNA segments. And the packaging of each segment depends on the other one going in. So the first segment to go into the capsid is the S segment. And that's the only one that can go in on its own. Next comes M. M can only go in if S is present. And then finally, the large segment 
uh, can only go in if S and M are present. So we call this sequential packaging, and it's obviously involving recognition signals. Um, curiously, the particle to PFU ratio of, of these viruses is one, which means that every particle is infectious. And that's quite different from flu. So it may be that that is because, in part, you get the right segments into every particle, and you don't make non-infectious ones. Yeah? Uh, that should be M. That should be M. That's a typo. Yeah. Thank you. Finally, let's talk about getting an envelope on these viruses. I think you've seen how this works. Uh, we've talked about two distinct ways where this happens for flu. You assemble the internal structures and then you bud out. With retroviruses, the whole thing forms at a concerted step. If you look at all the viruses we know about, there are uh, they can be classified into four categories depending on what is needed for budding. Sometimes uh, you just need to express the envelope proteins and the capsid, and that's enough to get a particle. Uh, sometimes the matrix is enough to drive budding, like in retroviruses. Sometimes the envelope proteins alone, coronaviruses and influenza, you can get particles with just the envelope proteins. And sometimes uh, the matrix will drive budding, but you need other viral components to get uh, efficient and accurate budding. And why is this important? Well, if you're going to design a vaccine based on a virus-like particle, you want to make sure that you're going to get the correct uh, particle budding. So this is an example of, which we've already shown, where the components of influenza are made separately and then assembled into the budding particle. So their assembly is spatially and temporally separated, if you will. Uh, the signals for directing the M protein are, again, uh, lipid binding regions. So the M protein has to go from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane. Very much like the meristate on the retrovirus M protein, there's no meristate here, but rather there are hydrophobic regions which direct uh, the, cap the M1 protein to that area. And again, the retrovirus strategy, uh, the matrix is directed to the plasma membrane by the meristate anchor, and the whole assembly is concerted. It happens all at once uh, during the budding. Now, how do virions bud from the cell? This was pretty obscure until uh, about 10 years ago. It was found that certain amino acid changes in the gag protein of retroviruses could, could cause an inhibition uh, such that you got these um, stalks of virions which never separated from the host cell. So single amino acid changes in GAG could lead to this. And this led to the identification of what are called L or late domains because they arrest budding at a late stage. It turns out that these late domains, they're found in many envelope viruses, they bind cell proteins that are needed for budding. And I'll show you how that happens. So here are just some retroviruses and phyloviruses, Ebola and Marburg, rhabdoviruses, arenas. They all have these L domains in their glycoproteins. So these are all glycoprotein genes. The L domains are areas which you can change and it will arrest budding at this late stage. So what these do is they bind a series of cell proteins called the escort machinery. And these are uh, proteins for, that are involved in membrane-membrane fusion reactions in cells. So for example, when cells divide, here's here, two cells about to divide. Here, the escort machinery, these are a series of complexes of proteins, they mediate the membrane fusion and breakage. Uh, also, when vesicles come into cells by endocytosis, uh, they often fuse to a larger vesicle in the cell called a multivesicular uh, body here. And this fusion occurs via the escort pathway. So there is a series of proteins in the cells that mediate such, such membrane-membrane fusion reactions. What the retroviruses and all the other envelope viruses have done, they have usurped this pathway and they turn it to the surface of the cell and cause their particles to bud. So normally cells don't make buds, but the viruses take this escort machinery and they direct it to the plasma membrane. And they do so because GAG binds the escort machinery. And of course GAG is anchored to the plasma membrane via this lipid, this meristate signal. So that directs escort to the plasma membrane, and that is what causes the virus to bud out. It's really an amazing uh, takeover of a, 
uh, an apparatus that's normally done used for something totally different in the cell. <clears throat> now, when viruses do bud, they can bud from several places. They can bud from the ER. They can bud from the Golgi. Uh, they can they can bud from any stack of the Golgi as well as the plasma membrane. These are just examples of that. So I don't want you to think that budding just happens at the surface. Uh, viruses can even bud from the, the nuclear membrane. So what would happen if a virus did bud from the nuclear membrane, as does herpes? It gets very complicated. So here is herpes. The nuclear capsid is assembled in the nucleus. It buds out of the nuclear membrane, and then it fuses uh, into the ER. It then fuses with the uh, ER membrane to get in the cytoplasm. It goes through the Golgi. It picks up a membrane uh, in the Golgi and then it buds out of the Golgi, it picks up a second membrane, and then finally it fuses at the cell surface. So in order to get from uh, the nucleus to the cell surface, you have to go through lots of envelopment stages. And the last thing we'll touch on briefly is how viruses get out of cells. Uh, they, can, they can kill the cell, they can break it open and get released by lysis or they can move from cell to cell. And this is important because as we consider pathogenesis, this is going to have a number of implications. So here's an example of release of virions uh, from the plasma membrane. This is an HIV-infected T cells. You can see these budding virions are released from the cell. Uh, and they see they're polarized. They're in one place only. And that goes with the whole idea that you focus all of the synthetic activities in a very specific uh, portion of the cell. Some cells can get, some viruses get out of the apical domain of the cell, and if you're going to spread by the respiratory route, this is very important. Uh, others can get out going from, uh, from the bottom, which is not shown here, and that will be important for spread by the blood, as we'll see later on. Uh, and other viruses never go out of cells. They spread from cell to cell laterally, as shown here, and all these different ways have implications for pathogenesis, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Here's a great picture I wanted to show you of uh, herpes virus infecting an axon. So these are labeled virions. You can see them replicating in the axon. They come out. They're released from the terminus of the axon, which is right here. And then they go on to infect uh, epithelial cells. So it's an example of very specific release from a very specific structure on the axon. Uh, some cells, of course, lice. They break open. Uh, we showed this picture a long time ago where uninfected cells infected with polio slowly round up and break open and release virus. These are some of the mechanisms that cause lysis of cells, apoptosis, uh, various inhibitions of cellular processes, and there are even some viral proteins that are made that specifically break open the cell. And again, we're going to talk about this quite a bit in terms of viral pathogenesis because if a cell is destroyed by infection, that's going to be part of the disease uh, pattern that it causes within you. And the last thing I want to show you is um, an example of how um, viruses actually mature outside of the cell. We talked about an example of retroviruses um, maturing when the particle is made and the protease inside the particle uh, becomes active. This is another example. This is actually a bacteriophage, uh, which was isolated from an acidic hot spring in, uh, in Italy. These uh, bacteria, the hosts of this virus, grow at pH 1.5 between 80 and 93 degrees. And as they are produced from, these are phage, as they are produced from the bacterium, uh, they look like this. They are sort of lemon-shaped guys. And then in the extracellular medium, they begin to mature. And they end up having these two long tails on either side. And they look like this. So this is as produced by the bacteria. It's not finished maturing yet. Apparently, it has within it all the enzymes or whatever that's needed to build uh, these two tails. So this is an even more uh, extreme example of extracellular maturation compared with retrovirus because we're actually extruding uh, tails here. We don't understand how this happens, but presumably there are other examples of this as well. So the, the bottom line is that not all assembly has to happen uh, in a host cell. <clears throat>